Barking spiders. That was a fun story, in my experience. Moreover, there's a great deal of nuance in the presentation and final themes of the story, and our character's journey, first separate, then finally together. The story is first presented as a clash of ideologies, writ large in nationalistic pride and in the very different technologies of industry, the naturalist Darwinists and the mechanist clankers. We the audience are expected to suspend disbelief so that we can comprehend a world where creatures are designed and engineered just as machinery in our history to fulfill a similar diversity of roles, while vehicles and weapons can be made to mimic the same intricate locomotion and functionality of living creatures. Behind the fantasy of living technology, the story revolves around the journeys of two children, both entrenched deep in the aspects of their own worlds, but only through their own journeys starting to discover the full meaning of how their worlds shaped their lives. More importantly, they get to learn how some important life values cannot be contained by ideologies of flesh or metal. We start the story first from Alex's perspective, the son of a noble member of an empire, and we find him literally playing war. Alec is young and has only a theoretical understanding of what function war serves in the empire he resides in. His world of the Austria-Hungarian Empire is the world that is post-medieval and expansionist, where instead of the nobility and royalty fighting each other for dominance of fiefdoms, they come together to control vast territories, huge populations, and look outward for more. In Alec's mind, his position as the son of a noble compels him to study and understand war, such that he, as a noble, may be expected to provide leadership to the empire's fighting men in war. And the reason the power and burden should fall on him and his noble house and his class is because of the divine right bestowed on his class by the religious leadership of his world, the Holy Roman Papacy. Of course, just like what started the world's descent into World War I in real life, Alec's life is upended by the murder of his parents, and he must flee and go into hiding with just a handful of loyal retainers. Instead of carrying the banners of his noble house and his empire into battle, leading soldiers against the empire's enemies, now Alec must flee the very same empire that's marked him as an enemy. The story presumes the Austria-Hungarian Emperor and the allied country Germany wants war for some reason not explicitly stated, and Alec's parents were killed for promoting peace. Alec is hunted because despite his nobility being incomplete by virtue of his commoner mother, he is still a threat to the Emperor's power. The secret that supposedly makes Alec a threat to the Emperor is the revelation that his father had convinced the Pope, the source of divine right to rule, to make Alec's birth noble, without question, to be revealed only after the current Emperor's death. Presumably, finding the secret means Alec's enemies have reason to fear his survival and want his threat ended lest their own emperor die for the stress of war, and Alec gain new legitimacy and power to end the war. On his journey into hiding, Alec and company move cross-country clandestinely, attempt to discreetly resupply without being discovered, and, when discovered, end up killing soldiers of the Empire to survive. For the first time, Alec faces war intimately, and not theoretically, from a safe place of study or a position of protected leadership. On his journey, Alec is also confronted with the pressure to hide and close himself from strangers 
for fear of malice. Adding to this is the realization that his upbringing puts him far out of touch of the concerns and sentiments of his own people, the citizens of the empire. In preparation for imperial treachery, Alec's loyal caretakers prepared not only their escape, but also a hideout, well-provisioned and defensible, such that Alec may wait out the war started in the name of his murdered parents. So Alec, son of an archduke, orphaned and hunted by an empire, is left with a choice. Hide himself until the war ends, his enemies subside, and come back out to take his rightful place in the empire, or seek an alternative. Meanwhile, Darren Sharp is a common citizen of the British Empire, who starts the story seeking enlistment into the Royal Air Service, such that she may be able to fly the way she used to with her late father. She faces the obstacle that the society of her time denies military service to women as a matter of course, so she disguises herself as Dylan Sharp in order to enlist. More than disguising herself as a boy, Darren ends up as a crew member of Living Airship Leviathan and starts her journey learning how to interact with and manage the wide variety of beasties that make up the ecosystem of the airship. She also gets first-hand experience in how all this organic technology is designed for war, and what it means to be on either side of the deadly weapons. At the same time, Darren's position as a midshipman on the Leviathan has her confront how she fits into the ecosystem of the airship's crew. Through a freak accident on her first day, trying to enlist in the Royal Air Service, she's carried into the air and is rescued by the Leviathan, itself on its way to mobilize and train for war. In a way similar to how the onboard beasties compete for their allotment, so too Darren feels part of a competition with the other middies for a more permanent place on Leviathan. At the same time, Darren regularly practices her deception, lest she be expelled from her new home. After picking up their scientist and cargo for a special mission, one we learn at the end takes them to the Ottoman Empire, the Leviathan is attacked en route, and Darren gets to witness the savagery and violence of war firsthand, losing a number of the crew, the beasties, and forcing the Leviathan back down to Earth. By the supposed laws of natural philosophy, the Leviathan would certainly have gone extinct, and Darren herself would certainly have ended up part of the casualties, were it not for the arrival of a new friend. When Alec and Darren finally meet, their respective empires have already come to blows, and even within personal interaction, they're threatened with each other's animosity as an extension of those empires. Alec, as a noble of the Austria-Hungarian Empire, a successor of the Holy Roman Empire, was taught that the Darwinist powers took their power from godless creatures and thus could not be trusted. Darren, a commoner raised in the British Empire, was taught that the Clanker powers actively reject the benefits of natural philosophy in favor of a ruinous mechanization that would figuratively choke the life out of society, and thus cannot be trusted. It makes sense that the Clanker powers would reject essentially genetically engineered creatures when either by popular perception or religious edict, they would be labeled godless. Additionally, the religious component of royal and imperial rule would put pressure on figures in power to create and enforce laws to limit and counter the expansion of Darwinist power. Meanwhile, the Darwinist powers would be well within reason to reject mechanization when they themselves already experienced their coal-fired and steam-driven industrial revolution 
and then collectively chose to reject it in favor of, essentially, genetically enhanced livestock. In Great Britain in particular, the independent religious establishment may very well have decreed the mass mechanization to be an affront to godly nature. Of course, whatever advantages each side claims for themselves, and whatever disadvantages they claim for their rivals, both sides of the argument belie the deeper, more fundamental power structures of the empires themselves. That which demands that their subjects oppose each other and act in favor of that power structure. When Alec and Darren meet for the first time, it's when Alec approaches the stricken Leviathan to offer medicines and first aid to the crew, despite his fears of the beasties. Yet, when Darren comes to, her first loyalty is to her airship, crew, and empire, and proceeds to have Alec cornered and taken into custody by the crew, despite his protest. The reasons for doing so were certainly rational. When wrecked on the isolated glacier, they are right to be concerned about who should come by in such a short time. Just a short while before, Alec, seeing the Leviathan come down, is advised against approaching, much less helping the stricken crew, despite his own sense of compassion. His loyal retainers are explicitly opposed to helping, even if the crew were to die on the glacier. They certainly had their own reasons for doing so, hiding from one empire hunting them down, and now avoiding a vessel of another empire that would certainly take them into custody and use them as political leverage if they ever return to safe harbor. Of course, the very structure of power in an empire is exactly what imperiled Alec and his retainers, and still persists even when in remote, neutral territory. When Alec's loyal retainers sought to spirit him away in the night, the very suspicion that they may be lying about his parents' murders and were kidnapping him nearly led him to come to blows. Any success fighting off his kidnappers would have certainly delivered Alec to his actual enemies. Additionally, after Alec finally realized the truth of his peril, his group moved clandestinely cross-country, avoiding detection by being properly disguised as commoners. I would just theorize at this point and figure, depending on the reach of the Empire's agents and the degree of information control to the rest of the nobility and masses, it's likely possible that Alec and company really couldn't afford to be seen even by commoners. It's likely that not only would the Emperor's agents reach out to professional circles, like town mechanists, to look out for a wayward Archduke's son, but also to the owners of food and housing establishments, or the leaders of police or military garrisons. With only the need to satisfy loyalty to the Empire, as a necessary price. And with the European war first imminent and then well begun, it would be easy to compel the citizenry to act in patriotism to catch Alec. The alternative is that the power of the nobility and military is so far removed from the citizenry that only by blending in with the commoners could Alec avoid detection. Alas, Alec and company fail, and are assaulted by military police, which leads to casualties, and the loss of Alec's innocence to war. The plan of Alec's retainers for him to survive the war even depends on the imperial power structure that's right now out to kill him, somehow later being weakened by the war, such that the emperor himself would be out of power, one way or another, leaving an opening for Alec to come out and wield the influence necessary to end the war and reclaim his birthright. There's no way to tell in story what level of support there was in the empire for peace in Europe, so engaging with the imperial power structure to end the war and reclaim peace still seems like a long shot. It seems just as likely that Alec becomes vulnerable to assassination again, as the pro-war faction that sought war in the first place 
continues the war to protect their power. Meanwhile, as far as the Darwinists are concerned, when the admiralty and political leadership of Great Britain gets wind of clanker guests on board Leviathan by story's end, their interest in Alec and company is suspect. Britain and Austria-Hungary are not at war as of yet, but the opportunity for one empire to control another through a puppet like Alec is a possibility that's easily apparent to Alec, his retainers, and Dr. Barlow. We also learn through Dr. Barlow that Leviathan's mission to the Ottoman Empire is a direct response to a diplomatic incident between the Ottoman and British empires, where Britain withheld a warship commissioned for service with the Ottomans on the fear of the Ottomans joining Germany in war against Britain. Withholding the warship presumably guarantees the Ottomans become enemies, unless Barlow's mission aboard Leviathan is successful. If the events of the story were driven solely by the competing desires of rival empires, Alec, Darren, their company and crew would likely be lost, and war across the whole of Europe would have gone on anyway. The way our cast of characters survive the story starts and ends with overcoming suspicion and trusting each other not to act out of ignorance or fear. When Darren and Leviathan are downed on the glacier, Alec takes a leap of faith, bringing medical aid, saving Darren's life. When Darren has Alec taken into custody, and his clanker origin is revealed by Dr. Barlow's observation, Darren chooses to trust Alec's intent and accept his help, instead of treating him with suspicion. While searching for Alec's origin and finding Alec's retainers coming to his aid, Darren ropes Alec into an act of desperation to keep the shooting from starting. Darren trusts Alec that they want him alive, and Alec trusts that Darren doesn't really want to hurt him, ensuring that words come out before the bullets. When negotiating for Leviathan to be provisioned to heal and leave, and for Alec to stay hidden, Darren and Alec overcome their mutual suspicion instilled in them by their empires to come to an understanding, Darren recognizing Alec's sense of compassion, and Alec recognizing in Dylan the kind of soldier he wanted or thought he wanted to be. It is also at this point where Alec opens up about his loss for the first time, trusting Dylan to keep his secret for the sake of keeping peace between the two groups. Darren, in turn, recognizes in Alec the same grief and suppression of that grief that afflicted her when her own father was lost. When the whole group is set upon by German forces aiming to take Leviathan and kill Alec, Alec and Darren face the danger together, and out of the loss of both crew, beasties, and Alec's armored walker, comes to the realization that the Leviathan getting away and Alec staying hidden and protected is no longer possible. When confronting the possibility of escaping only by custody of the Darwinists, and formally requesting this of Dr. Barlow, the truth of Alec's identity and grief comes out, and Darren is there to fully understand and empathize with Alec, as to feeling that all the war and suffering that's happened, and yet to come, is somehow in a way their fault. Darren felt the same guilt for the loss of her own father. With Alec opening up and Darren empathizing, the trust between them is grown stronger. Their only path forward is together. At this point, there is no choice now but for the Darwinists and Clankers to combine the surviving airship with the surviving engines of the crippled walker and leave the glacier together, and none too soon as the Germans come again with forces ready to kill them all. The final act of faith that cements trust between Darren and Alec is when Darren is expected by her captain to observe Alec and company and disclose what she learns for the benefit of the Admiralty and her government. Instead of turning Alec over for the good of the Empire, Darren offers to protect Alec's secret instead, 
and when Alec offers to give himself up for Dylan's sake, lest he be tried for treason, Darren is just about to reveal her own secret that can help protect his, when Dr. Barlow interrupts, postponing Darren's reveal. An aspect of Alec and his family, and his history, is explicitly mentioned in story, how the strength of his noble family and house has been based on making alliances rather than by conquest. Indeed, even with a handful of loyal retainers, an armored walker, a well-provisioned castle, and even a substantial amount of gold with which to sustain him away from the empire and the war, Alec wouldn't have been saved when his enemies finally caught up with him, air forces and dreadnought in tow. It was Alec's ability to make allies, and even friends, with Darren and Dr. Barlow that saves everyone by story's end, something highly unlikely if left to the older characters more traditionally concerned with imperial interest. While Alec confronts the supposed need for deception throughout the story, and by the end largely rejects deception in favor of making allies, Darren herself has no choice but to totally commit to her deception, perfecting her persona as Dylan in order to keep flying. At the same time, Darren is committed to earning the trust of her crew, and later that of her newfound friend in Alec and company. Their trust in her is indeed important enough that she comes close to revealing her secret when circumstance interrupted. In the end, it was indeed Alec and Darren learning to trust each other that saved them both and allowed them to continue their journeys together as the war threatens to consume their world.